That's why we're here, church.
foundation is built on the knowledge of Jesus Christ. He is risen from the dead. Then no one caught in sin. Matthew chapter 9, verses 10 through 13, this is what it says. And then it happened that as Jesus was reclining at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were dining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why is your teacher eating with the tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard this, he said, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And uh, Wednesday night, you missed a, a great opportunity to just have a sweet time with Jesus uh, at our Wednesday night program uh, called The Rock for our youth. And uh, we read that passage right before. It's okay to not be okay. Because if you're in the house today and you're looking at me and you're saying, I'm okay, I don't have anything wrong with me, then Jesus didn't come for you. But he did come for people like me, and he did come for people like you because we've got so many problems. And so I just want to say this. If you're a guest or if you're uh, somebody who's, who's been here since you can remember, 
uh, I know that it's so easy on a Sunday morning to go and you put your clothes on thinking that this is going to conceal my sin. This is going to conceal my brokenness. This is going to conceal me from the rest of the world, but it doesn't, it doesn't conceal you from the Lord. And so I just want to challenge all of us. Because I want to challenge you to, to just let, let yourself be how you are, which is probably not okay. Now, it's not okay with being okay with not being okay. <laughs> but Jesus came for people like me and you. Amen? So let's just pray to the God that, that made it okay for us to be the way that we are as we come to him this morning. Let's bow. Lord, I don't know why you would look at somebody like me and see your workmanship, but you do. And right now there's a whole lot of people that have gathered in Central Baptist Church because they just want to they just want to hear from you. Lord, I know that they might have told themselves that this is just their Sunday morning tradition. They might have told themselves that that they're here to please maybe their their parent or their family. But Lord, we want to hear from you. Because when we do the void and the emptiness in our lives gets filled with grace and mercy and love. And so, Father, my prayer for Central this morning is that we would not be a church of people who come in our self-righteous Pharisee manner. That we would not be as the Sadducees. We wouldn't be like those people who wore the best clothes, that drank uh, the best drink, that ate the best food, and did all the righteous things just right that we would be the broken people of God that have been redeemed by your blood and your grace. Lord, I love you. I love you so much. I pray that we would get to experience you in a way that is beyond tradition, that is beyond contemporary, that is beyond all these things and all these words that we try to characterize a church service, God, but it just be holiness. In your blessed and holy name, amen. Let's go.
Lord, that praise is for you. Even so, come in spite of all that we truly are, in spite of all of our flaws, all of our weaknesses, all of our imperfections, God, you love us still. Our desire is to be that radiant bride of Christ, holy and spotless, without blemish, total and complete perfection. And we acknowledge this morning that that can only take place because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. He paid the penalty once and for all. And not only did he pay the penalty, he rose from the dead. We celebrate Jesus' resurrection on Easter, but the truth is he's still risen today. God, we thank you for that. And right now, Father, would you still our hearts? Would you prepare right now for each one of us to receive a message from your holy word? Lord, we love you with all that we are and all that we can be. And we bless your holy name. Amen. We've met this morning to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're excited about having a Savior because we need to be saved from our sins. Our sins cause a problem for us. The problem is, uh, well, it's multifaceted, but a major part of it is simply this. God, who is holy, is completely holy, is repulsed by sins. You see, the problem with sin is it's repulsive to God. And so if we have sin in our lives, how can he look at us with that sin? Because when he looks at us and he sees that sin, this is something a holy God can't endure. And that's why he gave us his son, our Savior, to wash away our sins. Our God is repulsed by sin. That's a problem because we are sinners. You see, the problem with sin is it's repulsive to God. The problem with sin is it's fun. I know. Don't say that out loud. There are children in the room. They already know. We figure this out on our own. We, we are drawn toward certain behaviors. We are drawn toward certain actions. We are drawn toward certain things that are sin, and we're drawn toward them because we like them. We enjoy them. They're pleasurable to us. The Scripture says in, in Hebrews 11 that Moses chose to suffer with the people of God instead of enjoying the pleasures of sin for a season. The Bible is open about the fact that sin is pleasurable. It, it's attractive. Uh, it's, it's something that, that we want. I really hesitate to bring this subject up because I don't want your mind to wander any more than it may already be wandering, but most of you are planning on eating lunch today, right? You may be dreaming of eating lunch, maybe what's getting you through this time. You know lunch is not far away. Are you planning to eat worms for lunch? No. If you go fishing, will you put a worm on the end of the hook? Yes. Why? Because the fish wants the worm. And you can hide the hook and the barb in the hook from the fish. As a matter of fact, he won't notice the part of the hook that is exposed and probably won't notice the fishing line because you've distracted him with a worm. And he likes the worm. And what Satan does when he tempts us to sin is he comes to us and he says, do you want to do this which is fun, this which is pleasurable? He never tells the other part, like, you know, we don't tell the fish. Do you want a worm? And do you want to be my lunch? I'll give you your lunch and you'll be my lunch. You don't mention that last part. And what Satan does with sin when he tempts us is he comes to us and he says, you want to do this? You'll enjoy it. You'll like it. It'll make you smile. And he never says, and then... It'll make you frown, and then it will hurt you, and then it will destroy you, 
He doesn't tell you everything about it, just the fun part. So when Satan tempts us with sin, he tempts us with the pleasurable part of sin. Satan's evil. He's not stupid. And so he doesn't come to you, and, and he never comes to you, and he's never going to come to you and say, hey, you want to do something that'll just rip your life apart? Hey, you want to destroy everything you've built to this point in your life? Yeah, you want to do it? No, we know the answers to those questions. So he packages sin in such a way that we find it attractive. The problem with sin is it's fun. The problem with sin is it's repulsive to God. The problem with sin is the consequences are often invisible. You remember when sin first came into the world? In the, in the book of Genesis, we're told our Adam and Eve were in the garden and everything was perfect and then they messed up and, sin, and sinned. And don't you like to think, I like to think that, that, that if I were in the garden, I wouldn't have brought sin into the world. But there's evidence in my life that says otherwise. Eve was walking in the garden and she got near the tree they were not supposed to eat the fruit of. And the serpent said, eat the fruit. And she said, God says, if I eat the fruit, I'll die. And Satan says, you won't die. Eat the fruit. And Eve took a bite of the fruit. If when Eve had taken a bite of the fruit, she had fallen over dead, what chance do you think the serpent would have had when Adam came into the garden, saw Eve lying there dead, said, what happened? She ate the fruit. Here, you eat the fruit. You won't die. Adam wouldn't have eaten the fruit. But he walked up and Eve said, I've eaten the fruit. It's good. It's tasty. It's pleasurable. And Adam says, I thought we would die if we ate that fruit. I'm not dead. She had begun to die, but she hadn't died yet. And when we bring sin into our life, the consequences of that sin begin destroying our lives. So the moment we let the sin in our lives, we just don't see those consequences immediately. And so Satan brings sin in in a soft way, a subtle way, it's as if it's a, a nice piece of fruit. Not it's the fruit that's going to make you die. And so when Satan brings the sin into our lives, he brings it in in such a way that, that we're tempted by it, and we look at other people committing the sin, saying, they're not dying, I know people who do this, and it hasn't destroyed their life, therefore, it's going to be okay. The problem with sin is the consequences often remain invisible for quite a long time. It's fun. It's repulsive to God. The problem with sin is, Sometimes it's good gone bad. If, if all sin were just these really horrible, evil things, we could at least identify them and say, oh, that's sin, that's sin, that's sin. But sometimes sin actually is something good overdone to the point it becomes bad. That's what happened to the Pharisees. They wanted to obey God's Word, and God's Word said that you shouldn't do any work on the Sabbath. And a blind man came to Jesus, and Jesus wanted to heal him. And those whose sin was not doing bad, but doing good so much that it became bad, said, Jesus, you can't heal the blind man. It's the Sabbath. Oh, and with all his heart, that blind man was hoping that Jesus knew that sometimes being good can actually be a sin. And Jesus healed him. And a lot of good people condemned him. When I was in high school, I knew that cheating was wrong, right? I mean, we can figure this out. Is it right or wrong to cheat on a test? It's not a trick question, it's not difficult, it's wrong. You shouldn't cheat on a test. So I'm sitting in, in homeroom, and this guy next to me, he's 
making notes. Little tiny notes on a little tiny piece of paper. He's working. And I said, what are you doing? He said, i got a testing experience. Oh, you're studying. No, I'm making a cheat sheet. And he had this little tiny piece of paper with keywords and things he needed to know. And, and I watched him work. He worked on it the whole time so he'd be ready for his test. Now, I was a Christian. I knew the difference in right and wrong. I knew cheating on a test was wrong. So at the end of the class, I said, let me see that piece of paper. And he gave it to me. And I tore it into little pieces. Because it's wrong to cheat on a test. You know what? It's wrong to be mean to the people next to you. It's wrong to be arrogant. It's wrong to be self-righteous. Do you think after I did that to him, I could ever tell him about the love of Jesus? Do you think he would come to my church and want to be like me? No. Because I'd let something good in my life, let's not cheat on test, become something bad. I'm going to condemn you. I will be the judge in your life. I will pass judgment on you because I am right and you are wrong. That is pride, and it is sin. The problem with sin is, sometimes it's good gone bad. The problem with sin is, consequences are often invisible. The problem with sin is, it's fun. The problem with sin is, it is repulsive to God. The problem with sin is, sometimes it's a trivial thing. It's just a little thing. And and we'll look at it in our life and we say, you know, I know it's bad, but it's not all that bad. It's just this little thing. And that's like saying, no, no, let's keep going. It's not bad. It's just a little rock in my shoe. Just a little tiny rock. Have you ever stopped to get a rock out of your shoe? You take your shoe off because, you know, it's just jabbing in your foot and it's like this giant boulder is what it feels like. And you take your shoe and you shake it and it's like, did you see anything come out? I, I don't know. Did anything come out? You stick your hand down in your shoe, and it's like, I, I don't know. There doesn't seem to be anything there. You put your shoe back on, and whatever was in there is now gone. But oh, it hurts so bad. But when you went to try to find it, you couldn't even see it. It's that small. But it hurt that much. There are sins that we allow into our lives, and we allow them in because... It's just a little sin. It doesn't really matter. It's not one of the big ones. It's just a little thing. The problem with sin is, often it's trivial. The problem with sin is, everybody's doing it. You know, every child has tried to, has tried to use this logic on their parents. I have to go, everybody's going. I need this toy. Everyone has one. And every parent has spoken the words, really, everyone? I don't think everyone has a toy. I don't think everyone's going. You know, there is a time where that argument won't hold up. If someone ever says to you, everyone is sinning, you have to say, yeah, you got me there. Yep, they are. We are. Years ago, I was in a, a church service, and the minister got up, and, and he said, let's all share our favorite scripture verse. And so people started standing, sharing their favorite verses. So we had people mounting on wings like eagles and casting their cares on him, and God sending his only begotten son. And what the minister didn't know was there was a kid in our youth group, and I'd given him, he wanted to tell one of his friends about Jesus. I'm hoping he hadn't torn up a cheat sheet for that friend or the friend's not going to listen, but he wanted to tell his friend about Jesus, so I gave him a New Testament that was marked in such a way as you could share the plan of salvation easily. And Bruce had that Bible, and he wasn't really listening to what was going on in the sermon. He was, listening, he was reading through the new Bible I'd given him, and he had just gotten to a particular verse, and so when the pastor said, share us with us your favorite verse, I'm confident 
The only time this has been shared as a favorite verse in a gathering of Christians sharing their favorite verses, Bruce got up and said, my favorite verse is Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And he sat down and the pastor just stared at him like, really? You got a lot to choose from here and that's the one you're going with. We moved on. It's not a bad favorite verse. <laughs> it at least explains why we do what we do and why we're so far from looking like Jesus ourselves because we're surrounded by people who haven't gotten it right. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And unfortunately, we sometimes take comfort in that. And unfortunately, sometimes we hide behind that. And unfortunately, sometimes we say, well, I may be a sinner, but what about so-and-so? And what about so-and-so? And at least I'm not as bad as so-and-so. But in God's eyes, this is not about how you compare to other people. Your God is a holy God, and He's preparing a perfect place for you in heaven. And He wants you to show Him how much you want to be there. And one of the ways we show Him our love for Him is by living for Him. Jesus phrased it this way. He said, if you love me, you love me? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you love me? All right. If you love me, Jesus said, keep my commandments. But no one else is. All right. I'm supposed to keep your commandments. The problem with sin is everybody sins. It's often trivial. Sometimes it's good gone bad. Consequences sometimes remain invisible. It's fun. It's repulsive to God. The problem with sin is society praises it. There are sins that if you go out and commit them, people around you will say, whoo, good job. If you go out and, and in our culture, no matter how you do it, if you make a lot of money, people around you will say, wow, look at you go. That's a good thing. We're so fixated on dollars in our culture that, that we praise it. We can even become so fixated on, on hard work that, that this can happen in a church. You could be in a deacon's meeting, and a pastor could say, it's been 23 days since I took a day off. And the deacons will say, thank you for working so hard. Instead of calling them out on it, and saying, uh, you know, one of the big ten is having a day of rest. You've got to pull aside. Our society will praise sin on a variety of levels. We're living in a time where that which is evil is called good, and that which is good is called evil. We're living in a time where, where our culture has lost its knowledge of the clear teachings of the Word of God. And it makes it hard to live for God. It's a problem. The problem with sin is Society praises it. Problem with sin is we don't hate it. Oh, we say we do, but we don't. We tolerate it too much in the lives of people we love. We tolerate it too much in our own lives. We just let it hang around way too long. If, if you have me over to your house for a meal and for dessert, you serve bread pudding, I don't like bread pudding. If you serve bread pudding, I'll eat it. I'll be you served it to me and you made it and you and it's you know your grandmother's recipe and 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 I'll tell you something like I won't really say I like it because that would be a sin because that'd be a lie. So I'll say this is the best bread pudding I've had all year which will be completely true because I haven't had any in a year because I don't eat bread pudding because I don't like it. But I'll eat it at your house because I don't want to hurt your feelings. I don't hate it. I just don't like it. If I come to your house and you put a plate of food in front of me and it has a variety of things and on that plate you have served Brussels sprouts, <laughs> nope, I'm not going to eat them. And if you say, 
but I put a special cheese sauce on there. You've got to try it. No. It's my grandmother's recipe. I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> God didn't intend us to eat Brussels sprouts. If he, if he did, they wouldn't taste the way they taste. I hate Brussels sprouts. I'm simply not eating them. This is non-negotiable. In our lives, sin is, is negotiable. And we treat sin as something that, well, I don't want to hurt their feelings. I don't want to, call, you know, I don't want to be labeled a fanatic. I, and, and we allow all these sins to come in all around us because we don't hate it. And when there's something we really hate, we not only don't do it, we don't get near it, we don't have anything to do do with it. We don't hate sin. We need to hate sin. Even when we're living in a society that approves of it. Even when everyone around us is doing it. Even when it's a little thing. Even when it's good gone bad. Even when the, the negative consequences aren't showing up yet. Even when it's fun. We need to hate it. Because it is repulsive to God. The problem with sin is, Judgment Day is just so far away. It just seems like an eternity away. When I was in college, I would take three, four, five classes a semester. And one semester I had, I don't know, four or five classes. And, and one class was on biblical interpretation. And the professor at the beginning of the semester said, now, in this class, the, your whole grade is going to be based on one thing, the final exam. We're going to have a final exam. You'll take it. There's your grade. No homework? No. No pop test? No. No reading requirements? No. Just the final. So we all went through the semester, and, and, and on a Wednesday night when we had two or three classes coming on Thursday, and we had that professor who was going to give the pop quiz, or we had the homework assignment we had to turn in, or we could do the reading and study for that. When is that test? Oh, it's not till the end of the... You know what? We would take care of the immediate. And then all of a sudden, it's just like out of the blue, no warning, irrationally, the professor says next Tuesday's our final. Oh, no. Um... What class is this again? It was up to the professor how to construct his class, and that's how he constructed it. And we all had to study for that final exam. Let me ask you something. You believe that Judgment Day is coming and someday you'll give an account for your life? And the Bible says that we'll give an account for every word we've ever spoken. What if every Friday at 2 p.m. you had to stand before God and give an account of what you did the previous week? Do you think you would live differently each week? That final is coming. And we will stand before our God and we will give an account for everything in our life. And He has told us this. Now. Now is the time to prepare for that. But a problem with sin is judgment day seems to be an eternity away. A problem with sin is God already knows all about all of our sins. Sometimes we act as if He doesn't know. You know, like, if you do it in the dark, if you do it after midnight, you know, yeah, he, he won't know. No, He knows. Well, if you do it, but you don't tell Him about it, let's not confess it. Let's not... He knows. He knows everything. I'm always amazed at how our theology shifts depending on, on how we need it to shift. And with sin in their lives, people will say, now, do you really think God's looking over the whole planet and looking, looking down right here in Jacksonville and that He cares about what I'm doing? But then when something goes wrong in their life, and they need God there, and they need to know of His comfort and His care and His love. That's when they love the verses about every hair on your head is numbered. And He calls you by name. He does. He does when you need Him in, his life, in your life. And He does when you're hoping He won't find out what you're doing in your life. He's there. And that's a problem when it comes to sin. 
The problem with sin is we can hide it from other people. How many of you currently have a sin in your life and people around you don't know that you have it? A little show of hands here. Yeah, you're sharper than that, aren't you? But the fact is, A lot of hands could go up in answer to that question. Because you can't fool all the people all the time, but you don't have to fool all the people. Just the ones who would be bothered by the sin that's in your life, and you can hide it from them. And I'm going to say, can't you? And you don't say, amen. But can't you? Yeah, we can. You know, sometimes you'll hear people say, well, you'll never get away with keeping sin in your life. And everybody around says, I don't know. Maybe you can. (laughs) And because we can get away with it with people, or because we can get away with what happened back then, and we sometimes think we can get away with it, and we can't. But because we can, we think we can hide the sin. And because we can hide it from others, we think we've hidden it from God. But a problem with sin is we can hide it from others. But God already knows all about it. The problem with sin is it's habit forming. The first time we, we think about doing something, it's like, no, I shouldn't do that. I know I shouldn't. And the Holy Spirit says, don't do that. And the Holy Spirit says, no. And something within us says, go. And the Holy Spirit says, no. And we say, no, I'm going to go. And, and we wrestle it. And then we, we do it. And then we confess it and repent of it. And, and, and then we do it again and again and again. And eventually we come to that fork in the road where we have to decide if we're going to do it a sinful way or do it God's way. And we don't even notice we're at a fork in the road anymore because we've taken the path of sin so often that it looks like the only option available and it just becomes ingrained and it becomes a part of who we are. See, the problem with sin is it's habit forming. You can hide it from others. God already knows everything about it. Judgment Day seems to be an eternity away. We don't hate it. Society approves of it. Everyone around us is doing it. It's often a trivial thing. The problem with sin is sometimes it's good gone bad. The problem with sin is the consequences are sometimes invisible. The problem with sin is it's fun. The problem with sin is it's repulsive to God. I want us to take a look at the solution to sin. Our text for today, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. Because we have these problems with sin, and I just hit on a dozen of them, there are countless problems with sin. But because we have this problem with sin, our God, who is holy, has given us a solution to sin. And this is all you need to remember from the message this morning. The solution to sin is this. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. What's His job? His job is to be faithful. His job is to be just. His job is to forgive. His job is to purify. What's our job? Our job is to confess our sin. I don't know what your sin is. It may be something that's become so much of a habit you've quit calling it a sin. And this morning the Holy Spirit has said to you, it's time to call it a sin again. It may be something so trivial It may be something you've been getting away with. It may be something you don't think God's been noticing, but He does. It may be something society approves of. It may be something and the consequences haven't caught up with you yet. It may be something you're holding on to because of the pleasure it brings you. The problem with sin is it is repulsive to God. The solution is confess. Call it a sin. Tell God you know it is a sin. And you're ready to come to Him and let Him make you holy. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, our sin problem is very real. And until we become completely like Jesus, we haven't conquered it. And Father, we haven't gotten there yet. 
Maybe our sin is thinking that, that we're that person who doesn't sin. Father, speak to our hearts today. Help us to see how we need to change. Father, all across this room, hearts are being lifted to you and sins are being confessed. And I know that you are being faithful and you are being just, that you are forgiving and that you are purifying our hearts today. In the name of Jesus, who paid the price for our sins, we come to you unafraid to confess our sins to you. We offer our lives to you. We receive the love of Jesus. And we love him because he first loved us. Let's stand together to sing our hymn of commitment.